Okay, welcome to episode six of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast. Uh, I am Tim DeForest. I am the author of several books on pre-digital pop culture, such as the pulp magazines that Edgar Rice Burroughs was published in. Um, and I have a blog where I write about those, uh, that sort of thing as well. And with me today are... Guest Harold, you would know me from the Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. Where Lilla Pop, I, and a cast of about 3,000 are talking Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, John Carter, and all of all of Edgar Rice Burroughs' works, 24/7. Uh, and I'm Scott Stewart, uh, editor and writer. Tend to do a lot more editing than uh, personal writing nowadays. Associated with a zine we have coming out soon called Red Canals and. Randomi uh, Spotlight, Randomi Studios for uh, comics and uh, books and related media like that. Glad to be here with you guys. Thank you. And before we get into the, to today's subject, uh, Jess, you had a public service announcement. Yes. I uh, wanted to spend a moment talking about the Burroughs Bibliophiles, a nonprofit worldwide literary society devoted to the study and promoting interest in the works, creations, and life of Edgar Rice Burroughs including Tarzan, John Carter, Carson Napier, and several other heroes and worlds that you may be familiar with, and if not, then we're the people to talk to. Uh, membership benefits for Bur Burroughs Bibliophiles include four issues of the journal entitled Burroughs Bulletin, a slick cover, beautiful uh, publication with uh, fine articles and discussions in it. Also, the Gridley Wave newsletter. newsletter. The uh, Bibliophile organization also sponsors the an an annual convention held normally in the summer months. For more information, email burrowsbibliophiles at gmail.com or visit erbzine.com. You'll find information there about the Burroughs Bibliophiles. Or contact yours truly, Jess Terrell, in the Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. All right, next. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, well, today we're going to be talking about uh, Burroughs' 1927 Western, The War Chief, uh, which I think we would agree is not just an excellent Burroughs book, but one of the best Westerns out there. It really is a superb book. Uh, this was published originally in Argosy Magazine in 1927. It was serialized over five, five issues in April and May of that year. Uh, it was published as a book by McClurg later that year. Um, it was, along with a lot of other Burroughs stuff, it was out of print for some time, but in the Burroughs paperback revolution in the 60s saw it reprinted by Ballantine Books. Uh, there were several editions of Ballantine Books in the 60s and 70s, including uh, one in 1973, which I think has a particularly striking cover art by, by Frank McCarthy. Um, although all these editions had great cover art, the 75 version had Greg and Tim Hildebrandt do a really neat cover for it. Uh, it's available electronic now, uh, electronically now, um, and it is just a superb Western. Um, and the other thing I want to say before we get started is that the main character in this is a, he was a white guy who was raised as an Apache, and he thinks of himself as an Apache. And his, uh, uh, Burroughs uses his Apache name, which is, I'm probably going to pronounce it badly, Shaz Dejiji, through 95% uh, of the time. Occasionally, he will give us the English translation of that, game, of that name, which is uh, Black Bear, isn't it? Uh, yes. yes. Yes, and because we do not want to consistently mangle that name, we don't want to show any disrespect for the characters or for Apache culture, we are going to use Black Bear when we're referring to him. Uh, but just keep in mind that this character thought of himself thoroughly as an Apache, and that is the reason that Burroughs uses his Apache name the overwhelming majority of times in the book. So we are saying Black Bear simply because we all have Apache pronunciation issues that we don't, and we don't want to mangle it. Um, and so anybody else, uh, so Jess, uh, unless anybody else has some prelude, prelude remarks they can think of, Jess, you can go into starting to summarize the first uh, um, six chapters of the book. <laughs> Well, anyhow, if there's nothing uh, further, I'll proceed here. I, I certainly I would echo the comments about full respect for the American Apache, and uh, I, I am probably first to, to butcher names, and mm -hmm. I certainly do not mean to, and I will endeavor to be accurate as always. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a couple of these I will take a shot at uh, mm -hmm. at pronouncing, but generally we'll refer to them as the uh, as in the English translation. Yeah. So we've already established that uh, the protagonist or hero of the story, whose name is 
American Indian name is um, is Black Bear. Uh, his uh, before as a as an infant, his name is Andy McDuff, and we'll find out about him in, here in just a moment. Also, another American Indian name that uh, I want to, to clarify up front, I'll give this my best uh, attempt. Goyet Lay. Goyet Lay, who is Geronimo. And from this point forward, I'll generally refer to him as Geronimo. Chapter one, we find a couple of American settlers making their way out west. One is, and this is 1863. Now, note this is 1863 during the American Civil War. Jerry McDuff. Is, is the husband in this family unit that's traveling west by covered wagon. Uh, Jerry is, was not in the Army, neither north nor south, and not in jail. Able-bodied man of about 30 years old and not a coward, but he was headed for California along the old Santa Fe Trail during the Civil War, not involved in the Civil War. His wife, Annie Foley, is the granddaughter of a Cherokee Indian, and that's an important point in this story. And something I missed the very first time I read this back in the 70s when I was a young fellow. Now, they have an infant child, a baby, named Andy. And this Andy will grow up to be our protagonist or hero, uh, Black Bear. We joined them in the story just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, along the Rio Grande in 1863. Now, Geronimo was born in Nene Apache in Arizona in 1829. He wasn't born in 1820. Oh, 1863, that's right, in 1829, he was a stark savage. Already 34 years old, he was war chief of the Bedonkehi uh, tribe of his first wife, Alope, which he had joined after his marriage to her. The Geronimo, with four warriors, are tracking the McDuff's wagon. That's that young couple we were just talking about. You're heading west along the Santa Fe Trail. The Geronimo and four warriors are tracking the McDuff's wagon drawn by two mules. And during this, uh, Geronimo recalls the stories of the conquests of the Spaniards, such as Coronado, some 300 years before. These stories of Coronado are a legend among the Apache and already give the Apache, it, it frames their fears and concerns about the um, in, invasion of, by, by the white Americans. So there's some motivation for the uh, Apaches to attack this covered wagon vengeance, and also greed. Now, I'm quoting now from Burroughs. In those days, the Apache had fought only to preserve the integrity of his domain from the domination of an alien race. In his heart, there was not the bitter hatred that the cruelty and injustice and treachery of the more recent American invaders engendered. There was the lure of loot. The war is an Apache way of life. In fact, it's almost a religion with them. And that is brought out in this book. And I, and I got to say, I, I, I know... The others will agree with me that this book is very well written. It's as well written as any other, I think, as well written as any of the others of, uh, of Burroughs' uh, wonderful books that we all love. So if, if you've not read War Chief, I highly recommend it, and I'll probably repeat that. Message. Meanwhile, back to um, our story. The Indians attack. Jerry and Annie McDuff, that young couple I mentioned, are killed. The infant baby, Andy, our hero, protagonist is found and saved from another Indian brave who's about to bash his brains in. The attacking Apaches recognize his mother, Annie, as a Cherokee, and because of that, they spare the child. The, the child, in Andy, looked more Indian than his mother, with his round face, his big dark eyes, and his straight black hair. Geronimo thought of the child as an Indian. Now, this is important, and this line, this, this will come back during the course of the story, so keep that one in mind. Geronimo regarded the child as an Indian. Geronimo and his one of his wives, Morning Star, Sanzi Are, I believe is the name, adopt young Andy McDuff. Back to their camp, the Indians learn that Mangus, Colorado, chief of the tribe of the Bedonkohe tribe, is dead. But Mangus, Colorado, was invited to an army post where he was imprisoned and killed. And we'll learn a little bit more about that later on. So the takeaway from Chapter 1 is the parents of Andy McDuff are killed and the child is taken uh, by the Apaches to be raised as an Apache. Uh, yeah, I think there's something else that we could mention is that a warrior named Ju was there when, uh, uh, or Ja, however you say it, uh, was there, uh, was there when, uh, when Andy's parents are killed, and he wants to kill the baby too, and it's a good way of setting this guy up as kind of uh, Blackbeard's arch enemy later on. I mean, he wanted to kill him right from when he was a baby. So he's establishing this guy as a villain of the book right offhand. 
Exactly. That's that's the uh, person I was referring to when I was talking about someone wanting to bash the baby's brains Oh, yeah. Out. Sorry. I'm sorry. You did cover it. Yeah. Uh, right. I mentioned the name, so I'm glad you did. That's the benefits of a team. We all mm. cover each other. Yeah. Do not hesitate to jump in here and say something, particularly when, I, when, I, when I'm wrong, <laughs> uh, especially then. I'm never <laughs> accurate. But no, your point is well taken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, moving along here, Chapter 2, entitled Shaz de Gigi, which means black bear, and that was my best attempt at that pronunciation. Chapter 2. And this chapter covers black bear's childhood, where he earns his name and defends himself against doubters. With the Indians, the young Andy McDuff, Black Bear, grows up, and Geronimo is a good father. Uh, young Black Bear, he hasn't gotten that name yet, by the way, but that's what I'll call him. Young Black Bear learns of the chase, the battle, how to make and use weapons, his duty to kill enemies of his people, and to kill all enemies, I uh, know, of all enemies, the Mexicans were the most hated, and then the Americans. At eight, the boy was more proficient at trailing and hunting, this is a direct quote, more proficient at trailing and hunting than a white man ever becomes. He was adept as a marksman with primitive weapons. Significant event in the spring of 1873. This boy, uh, whom we know as Andy and as Black Bear, now 10 years old, armed with bow and arrows, kills a black bear. For this accomplishment, he earns his name Black Bear. The battle with the bear is well written, very well described. So that's an exciting sequence there to look forward to. And he's not believed at first. He goes back to camp to get some help from his, um, his um, uh, I'll start to say classmates, from his friends. He's 10 years old, so these are other children. He goes back there to get some help to, to drag this bear back to camp, and no one believes him. Of course, they believe him after they finally see the bear. That night, he's awarded the name Black Bear. So that night, Black Bear asked, why do we hate the white eyes? He puts this question to Geronimo, and I'm quoting now from uh, Burroughs' book. Quote, if some of our bad men killed some of them, the white men, they tried to punish all of us, not seeking out just the bad men among us who had made the trouble. They killed us all, men, women, children, where they found us. They hunted us as they would hunt wild beasts. They took away our lands that God gave us, and we were told we could not hunt where our fathers had hunted since the beginning of the world, where we had always hunted. But they hunted there, where they would. They made treaties with us and broke the treaties. The white-eyed man does not keep their promises. They are very treacherous. Uh, end of that quote. Now, uh, Yeah, actually, I wanted to add something about that, if I may. Um, go ahead. It's just that's part of, of – that's an introduction to what I think is a really strong moral balance in this novel. Uh, Burroughs obviously sympathizes in, entirely with the Apache because of the hypocrisy and the brutality of white culture towards them. And, uh, but he, later on, he's going to be critical of the Apache's tendency to torture and to kill women and children. And he's going to have some white characters, including a white cavalry officer, who are brave and personally honorable. So, and he's going to have an Apache uh, who's a total bad guy. So he's not falling into the trap of just saying somebody one side or the other is completely good or completely evil. There's going to be a moral balance to this, uh, this novel, which I think is a key to making it work so well. And, uh, and it's a realistic balance too. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just for strictly dramatic purposes. Yeah, he, uh, I know. Uh, Burroughs knew his subject. Uh, he, there's a long list on the ERB zine uh, site of the books he used to research, uh, research this. And, he worked as a cowboy as well, I think, in Montana. Uh, uh, Abajo, I think. Yeah, Abajo. So, which is not necessarily Apache territory, but he knew the lifestyle. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, um, he was, he knew his stuff. You know, he made up t Africa. Uh, you know, the Tarzan's Africa is a completely make-believe place, and it's a wonderful place. It's exactly the Africa it needs to be for Tarzan. But here, he did real research, and he's writing an accurately uh, historical novel that accurately portrays uh, that l the life at that time amongst the Apache and amongst the whites. Uh, th that's a very good point. In fact, I've already I had already glossed over uh, prior to this book. I, I left it out of the summary. That very point is made in the writings and uh, mm -hmm. in, in the dialogue mm -hmm. that that. All Apaches are, are neither good nor bad. There's a mix. Mm -hmm. And all white are neither good nor bad. There's a mix. And mm -hmm. that's, pretty, that's pretty much the way real life society is. Yeah. Uh, 
So it's just you have to take the individual's accomplishments or crimes um, a, as an individual and not, not the entire society or entire group. Right. And, and, I, and also for cultures as a whole, he obviously loves the Apache culture, but he's not giving them a pass on the fact that they torture people. Uh, that black bear through his life refuses to torture. I think Burroughs is using that as a condemnation of, of one part of Apache culture that he believes is simply wrong. Right. There's a middle road there someplace and mm -hmm. does not include torture. Yeah. Now, I mentioned Mangus, Colorado. He was an Apache chief, and here's what happened to him. And again, I'm quoting now from Burroughs', Burroughs uh, book. Some of the chiefs of the white soldiers invited us, that includes Mangus, Colorado, invited us to a council at Apache Pass with many others went, uh, Mangus, Colorado, many others went, believing in the good intentions of the white chiefs. Just before noon, they were all invited into a tent where they were told they would be given food, but instead they were set upon by the white soldiers. That's the end of that quote. Ja, the butcher, whom we spoke of a moment ago, growls when he hear, hears all this and, and, and points to um, Black Bear, saying he is the child of a white man. He should be killed. And Geronimo challenges Ja. But Jaw steps back, saying he does not wish to kill the child. Black Bear comes in, hearing some of this, and raises his arrow and points to the jaw. But Cochise calls the halt to the disturbance. Black Bear leaves after a warning to Jaw, and then Cochise warns Jaw to leave the child alone, leave the boy alone. Black Bear goes into the mountains to fight, to play at fighting his enemies, and doing so, he kills a jackrabbit. Black Bear viewed the white man as a coward, liar, and traitor. <laughs> He knew some white men sold weapons to the Indians. For someone to call Black Bear white, as Ja had just done, was the greatest insult that Black Bear could receive. Later, Black Bear approaches Cochise regarding his own heritage. And I love this sequence. So, again, quoting from Burroughs' book, and this is young Black Bear speaking. Black Bear is a little boy, said the, said the lad, and Cochise is a great chief. He is the father of his people. He is full of wisdom and true of the words that he speaks. Ja has said that Black Bear is white. Black Bear would rather be dead than white. And the great chief would speak and say if Black Bear be a true Apache that after this, Ja may keep a still tongue in his head. Cochise was a fierce and terrible old man. He was a great war chief of the Apaches, and yet his own people and more often with children, he had a very soft heart. And he too was a keen judge of men and of boys. And he saw this boy possess, this boy Black Bear, possessed a degree equal to his own, a pride of blood that would make him a stalwart defender of his own kind, an implacable enemy of the common foe. Year by year, the fighting forces of the Apache dwindled. To lose even one for the future was a calamity. He looked up from the boy and turned his eyes upon his warriors. If there be any doubt, Cochise said, and I'm quoting again, let the words of Cochise dispel it forever. Black Bear is as true an Apache as Cochise. Let there be no more talk. He looked directly at Ja. I have spoken, unquote. And Ja's cruel face gave no hint of the rage and malice surging through the savage breast. But Black Bear was not deceived. So the takeaway from this chapter is that Black Bear earns his name and, and, and we find out more about how Ja feels about the situation. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, uh, entitled the IP, this chapter covers the death of a chief and Black Bear saving the tribe. And once again, where the several Indian or Apache tribes uh, camped together, the Badonkahi, the Chokinin, and the Nenni were camped together, and with them, the Chahenni, they had recently been raiding in Chihuahua and Sonora. Now, Black Bear has continued to grow and develop. And Cochise has watched the youngster with great affection, told him of their wars with the Comanches and the Navajos on the raids on the Pimos and the, and the Papagos. Territory of the Apache, and this is amazing, listen to this. Territory of the Apache ranges from the Arkansas River in Colorado, that's on the north, to Carango, Mexico, that's on the south, from California, that's out west, to San Antonio, that's on the eastern side of Texas. That's an area as big as Europe. And all of this, said Cochise, that he was war chief. Cochise was war chief of this entire territory. And to the boy, he says, perhaps you someday may be war chief of all the Apaches. 
you know, that particular night in May, the Tiswin, that is a fermented beverage, which I think of right or wrong. I think of as an Apache uh, alcohol, beer perhaps. The Tiswin was flowing. The Braves were partying. Don't think less of them for, for all my talk of the Tiswin. These people have a demanding life under constant threat of attack by the U.S. or Mexican forces or even some other Indian tribes. So they partied a little bit, just cut them some slack. Mm -hmm. the, point, the point is, the next day, everyone is recovering from previous night's escapades. They're sleeping in with hangovers. Meanwhile, next morning, Black Bear, who was excluded from all this carrying on, goes out on patrol. That's the way he plays. He plays at, at, at being a warrior. You know, you, you play results in how you learn to do things as an adult. So he's playing at being a warrior. He's out on patrol. For in any culture, the games of childhood lay the foundation of adult activities. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Black Bear could take care of, oh, this is a quote, Black Bear could take care of himself better at age 11 than the majority of white men can at their prime. And he had learned more useful things from actual experience than the white boy ever learns, end quote. Now, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say there's just, a, there, you can't help but notice parallels between Black Bear and Tarzan. Uh, they're not exact parallels, obviously, but just that his his childhood and the nature of his play and all that were part of training him to be an awesome adult. There, uh, there's a definite parallel, um, also a more thematic parallel, and Burroughs is always condemning the hypocrisy of civilization in this book, as he often did in the Tarzan books. Well said, and... and and being interested in world building myself, I can see those parallels as I, as I read through this. I said, I've seen that before, but it was happening halfway around the world in the jungle. Mm -hmm. In a general sense, you have to tailor it and, 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 and twist it a little bit. But the, the basic framework is there. I agree totally with that. Mm -hmm. Now, so young Black Bear is out playing in the hills. He's playing at being warrior. And he notices about 20 miles away. Moving steadily towards the camp where all these Apache tribes are, are sleeping off the prior night's activities, he sees a long column of dust. Well, it would not be Apaches that were advancing towards him. It must be an enemy. And Black Bear's eyes were keen, but the column was enveloped in dust. However, he was confident he was looking at mounted Mexican troops. Black Bear knew that six Indian tribes lay vulnerable with hangovers just 10 miles from the advancing force. At camp with the Tiswin hangovers, some were recovering, some Indians were gambling, some were quarreling, and some were just getting up. And Cochise himself was very sick. So Black Bear skedaddles back to camp and sounds the alarm. Preparations are quickly made. The Braves are rallied, war paint supplied, scouts are sent out, and ambush is organized. Within five minutes, both sides of the canyon rim are bristling with weapons and warriors. Once the Mexicans were inside the canyon, Geronimo signals the attack with a shot from his carbine. There's no trouble, no cover, no cover for the Mexican troops. They're boxed in. They're taking fire from above. They have no chance. And Black Bear watches from above and quickly joins the, frac the fracas. He shoots a wounded Mexican soldier through the throat and takes a scalp. This is Black Bear's first scalp that we know of. But he, did, and to your point, Tim, he does not join in torture or mutilation. This reluctance will become a sore spot with his fellow Apaches. That night there was feasting and dancing and the loot was divided. Cochise was yet very ill, so Geronimo held his tribe with the Choconian. For him, the old war chief was as a second father. Cochise says to Geronimo, and, 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 and Cochise is, is very sick, uh, now quoting now, send for all the great chiefs of the Apaches. Tell them to come help frighten away the spirits of the white people, for they fear our war chiefs more than they do our medicine men. Go, Geronimo, or Cochise will surely die. Surely die. And he wouldn't say that unless he was indeed, indeed close, uh, close to the great, uh, great transference. Mm -hmm. And the quote, by the way, all the tribes gathered together before a large fire for a vigil at Cochise's hut. For six weeks, six weeks, Cochise lay ill. And for nearly all this time, warriors, medicine men, women, and children saw continuously by day and by night to frighten away the malevolent spirits by incantation and by noise. And nearby, Black Bear, and then when Cochise passes away, 
Black Bear mourns the, the loss of a kind, gentle friend. They knew they have courage, wisdom, honor, and loyalty. And these are all things that the American Indian values. Uh, and, and, and quite honestly, talking about the Burroughs world building, hearing those very uh, attributes, are, you'll find those uh, in military code and, and, and other uh, highly valued in other professions. Mm -hmm. Now, about the funeral procession, which I found to be quite elaborate, quoting again, Three warriors came, each leading one of Cochise's best ponies, and two stalwart braves raised the dead chieftain and lifted him astride um, the one pony which had been his favorite, in front of Chief Loco, who held the corpse in an upright position. The procession is led by four great chiefs, Geronimo, Victorio, Nane, and Jew, with the balance of his people trailing behind. Uh, I said Jew, I meant Ja, mm -hmm. who we've been talking about uh, as the uh, more or less villain here. A Ja, glancing back, saw a lad fall into procession directly behind the last pony. He halted the funeral procession, and the other chiefs turned and looked at him questioningly. Only those, he's, this is Josh speaking, only those of the blood of the Shizende may follow a great chief to his last resting place, he announced. The others grunted acknowledgement of the truth of that statement. Black Bear, the son of a white-eyed man, follows the war ponies of Cochise, said Ja angrily. Send him away. Geronimo did not speak, but his hand moved to the hilt of his knife, and Cochise himself proclaimed the boy an Apache, said Nane, another chief, and that is enough. Let the boy come to the grave of his friend, said Victorio. Cochise loved him. He, too, is as good an Apache as you or I. Did he not warn the tribes and save them from Mexicans? With my own eyes, I, Victorio, saw him slay and scalp. Let him come. So Black Bear is permitted to join the procession. So the takeaway from Chapter 3 it is the uh, death of a chief, and Black Bear saves the tribe. Now, moving into Chapter 4, which is entitled The New War Chief. With Cochise, the uh, Death Council gathers to select a war chief for all tribes to listen to. Geronimo is, a, is, uh, is, a, is a, yeah, that's right. Geronimo is the adopted father of Black Bear. Black Bear organize, meanwhile, Black Bear organizes a rabbit hunt. Ishkene, the uh, girl, uh, a young girl that he knows, uh, joins in. She's a tomboy, and they've played together somewhat. A black bear stands up for her when his friends will not let her join the rabbit hunt. As things progress, it's Ishkene who kills the jackrabbit. She and black bear continue to play together. They learn Apache ways. They learn about weapons. They learn about plants in the land, all the things an Apache needs to know. I lost my, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, Black Bear asked to attend the war party, uh, war party, and Geronimo, by the way, is appointed war chief. I think I skipped that. Uh, Geronimo sends Black Bear and his friend on a quest of preparation to learn. There are things they need to accomplish in order to be appointed a warrior. It's like a, a rite of passage, uh, similar to uh, earning a merit badge in scouting or earning a rank in the military. That's becoming a, a rite of passage. So they ask permission to uh, join the war party, and Geronimo sends them out on a quest, which includes uh, spending the night out in the wilderness, which is just up the hill. Moving on to Chapter 5 on the war trail, a black bear and his friend, uh, Jean Nata, uh, joins Geronimo on the war party heading south towards Mexico. It's 118 degrees in the shade. Quoting now from Burroughs, Perhaps during the long span of man's existence upon Earth, there has never been produced a more warlike race than the Apaches. They existed almost solely by war and for war. Much of their country was a semi-arid wasteland, producing little. Their agriculture was so meager as to be so meager, so meager as to be non-existent. They owned no flocks or herds. They manufactured nothing but weapons of war and of the chase, and some few articles of apparel and ornament. From birth, they were reared with but one ambition, that of becoming great warriors. Near the mountains, end quote, near the mountains of Sonora, the Apaches find their prey. Twenty wagons, each drawn by eight mules. Twenty Mexicans. At night, the wagons are in a circle, and two armed men are on guard. Black Bear is asked to take a closer look as a scout. So he creeps as close as one foot from a wagon wheel. He brings back... Uh, Information, intelligence, as they say on the, in the military. For two days and for two nights, the Apaches follow the wagon train. And Geronimo determines the Mexicans are most vulnerable during midday rest. 
At one such midday stop, the Apaches attacked. During the battle, Black Bear saves Geronimo's life. Two witnesses, and one was Ja, tense fight between Black Bear and Mexican. <coughs> Excuse me. Tense fight between Black Bear and the Mexican. A Black Bear thought he was done for, but did not cry out. The Mexican's gun shot barely misses him, and Black Bear finally drives his knife home. This, the passage is much more exciting than I'm making it out to be. Uh, that, yeah, but that, that's actually a good point. All of Burroughs is brilliant at action scenes throughout all his books, and he's he's and that's typical of these action scenes in this novel too. They are all exciting and vivid. You can picture exactly what's happening, and it's just a thrill to read. Indeed, very well said. Indeed, indeed it is. It's almost like being there, and you and you, you can see the tension, and particularly when. When when Black Bear and this Mexican are are going at it, I mean, you really are wondering. You have a gut feeling Black Bear is going to survive, sure, but you really are wondering how this is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. After the battle, while searching for loot, Black Bear puts the Mexican out of his misery. But Black Bear does not torture or mutilate. That that's uh, that's a lesson, a, a point here that Tim has already made very well, and that's reinforced throughout the story. He just doesn't think it's necessary. Chapter 6, The Oath of Geronimo. Black Bear, Jaw, and the others pack the spoils of war on the captured mules. Later, Geronimo tells Black Bear they had done well during the attack. But, and I'm quoting, Jaw says that Black Bear is a heart of water. They did not join the other braves in torturing the wounded or mutilating the dead. Black Bear killed three of the enemy, replied the youth. One in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. The coyote attacks the wounded and devours the dead. I cannot understand why you waste your time with the dead and the wounded. These I should think you would leave to the squaws and children. I, Black Bear, take no pleasure in fighting with the dead men who cannot harm me. I should not think that uh, one who is much braver than Black Bear would find pleasure in it. End quote. Geronimo, after this, describes how his mother, wife, and three children were killed by Mexican troops, which led him to take an oath to be revenged upon the Mexicans, to kill them wherever I found them, to give them no quarter, and show them no mercy. So we get some insight as to Geronimo's uh, motivation. Mm -hmm. On the march home, they attack a Mexican ranch. The Black Bear and Jean Nata conduct themselves very well. And back at their home camp, there's dancing, feasting, and rejoicing. Black Bear joins the young lady Ishkene at the feast, and then he notices she is growing up. He's been away for a while. He comes back, and he sees her with new eyes, and, and she is she is maturing before his eyes almost. He presents her with a silver crucifix and rosary, the spoils of battle. They both have a realization. They are changing and growing. The Black Bear notes that Ishkene will soon be a woman, and she responds at the next moon. So, uh, quoting now, twice again, must Black Bear take the war trail with the braves of his tribe before he can become a warrior? And he's talking to the young lady now. Not until then may he tie his pony before the teepee of Ishkene to await her answer to his uh, request. Ishkene is beautiful. Many warriors will desire her. Will Ishkene wait for Black Bear? And the young lady responds, until the sun gives forth no heat and the warriors cease to run, Ishkene will wait. In, end of passage. At that point, Moon, there was a huge celebration described over several paragraphs. Uh, the, ceremony, uh, the ceremony included <laughs> Ishkene getting her eyebrows plucked, and uh, other things you do when you're celebrating uh, a birthday, I suppose. <laughs> Black Bear takes no part in the uh, festivities. He tries to smoke um, a cigarette, or the equivalent of a cigarette, but gets sick. Quoting now, never before had Black Bear realized how wonderful, how desirable was was uh, Ishkene, and he saw that other youths and men thought that she was desirable. Once, shortly after the great feast, he saw ten ponies tied before her teepee, and among them was the war pony of Jah, the chief of the Nedne. For four days he watched them standing there as their owners watched them, but Ishkene did not come forth and did not feed any one of the ponies or lead them to water, and at the end of the fourth day, disgruntled, the disappointed uh, suitors came and took away their ponies. And after that, Black Bear was happier, and when it was dark that very night, he found Ishkene and sat down beside her and held her hand and heard her say over again that she would wait for him forever. 
That's a proclamation of love. End of that quote, by the way. That is cool. I just, on a personal level, I want to say that I, I recently got engaged, and I'm really glad I didn't have to do all that stuff with ponies and, <laughs> and uh, killing enough people to become a warrior and all of that, because that would have just taken a lot of romance out of, it as, out of it as far as our culture is concerned. But in this book, it really sounds awesome. With, so. <laughs> with, with, I'm plucking him. <laughs> Tim? I'm sorry? Did anyone get their eyebrows plucked? Nope, nobody got their eyebrows plucked, so we got to leave that part out as well. So, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Moving on now to chapters. So we've had this proclamation of love. Moving on now to the chop, chapter 7, Rated. Geronimo receives a message that he and Victorio are to attend a council with the white soldiers. A black bear goes along with Geronimo. They've had bad luck with councils before. That's how Mangus Colorado got killed and some others. And one of the quick takeaways from their meeting with the white soldiers is that communication is immediately a problem in, in, this, in this meeting. Because as they're speaking with the white soldiers, Apache, and this is in the book, no kidding, uh, Apache, and, and, I, and I, because of all that great research and Burroughs' personal experience, we've already established this, that I believe the book is very thorough. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's a work of fiction, no question about that. But I think it's very thorough. My point here is that Apache is translated into Spanish and then into English. English is translated back into Spanish and then into Apache. So this is how they're communicating. This doubles the chance for error and misunderstanding. And no one really knows if translations are accurate. That's the systems analyst in me talking here. Mm -hmm. So Geronimo is in prison because he left Apache Pass without permission when he took his troop down to Mexico. So Geronimo responded, I do not think that I ever belonged to the soldiers at Apache Pass, but that I should have asked them where I might go. This is my country. I have lived here all my life. It is the country that God gave to the Apaches who created them. It has always belonged to us. And why should we ask the soldiers of the White Eyes for permission to go from one part of our country to another? We have tried to live in peace with the White Eyes. We even tried to stay at Apache Pass. But the White Eyes do not know the ways of the Apaches, as do the chiefs of the Apaches. They did not know what they asked. The six, six tribes of the Apaches cannot all live together in peace. The young men quarrel. This we knew would happen, yet we tried to live together because we were told that it was the wish of the great white chief. Some of the young men got drunk on whiskey. It was sold to them by a white-eyed man. They fought and some were killed. We who are the chiefs of our people, we who are responsible for their welfare and happiness, held a council, and there we all agreed that the tribes can no longer live in peace together. End quote. Geronimo and seven other Apaches were taken to the guardhouse and placed in chains. Victorio and Black Bear were released, but the youth did not wish to leave his father, and he was horrified when he saw Geronimo was chained. Now, these people lived to be free, to roam the open range, to light, ride like the wind. Imprisonment and ridicule is the greatest suffering to the American Indian. Well, this is a maturing event for Black Bear. Black, back at camp, he's thinking this over. And he knows God made this country for the Apache. But why did God send the white eyes? And Victorio said it wasn't God, but it was bad spirits. Quoting now uh, from Burroughs' book. The bad spirits have sent the white-eyed men to kill the Apaches, he explains, so that God will have no one to guard them. And then they will be able to kill God then we should kill the enemies of, of God. It is right to kill them, said Victorio. Do they not kill us? End quote. A black bear tells Morningstar, he, that's his mom, uh, Indian mom, that he is leaving to be near Geronimo. A black bear knew the value of understanding language. Uh, quoting now, the language of the white eyes can be turned into a weapon against them if, if we understand it. If we understand it. And this, this becomes a, a great point that black bear here has realized. End, end of quote, by the way. Black bear learns there is a school at the army post to the Indians to learn English. He attends that school regularly for three months. The teacher's husband was skeptical, as were all the other officers, he said, well, he's an Indian, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. So you see the attitude here. Uh, now, quoting now from Burroughs' book, thus understandably sympathetically as the Indian question by approach by many army men and by practically all the civilians of the frontiers. To have said he is an Indian, he stands in the way of our acquisition of his valuable possessions, therefore we have no power to enforce his rights, and being in our way, we will destroy him. It would have been no more ruthless than the policy we adopted and cloaked with hypocrisy. It would have had a redeeming quality of honesty, and would have been a policy the Apaches 
could have understood and admired. End of quote. That's that's direct from the text. Yeah, that's a great quote, though. That just so vividly and 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 perfectly describes the hypocrisy of the situation from the point of view of the white authorities. Yeah, yeah. All I did was find it. It was it was <laughs> there for the for the finding. Yeah. But yeah, I agree totally. That's that's uh why. Why, why I was mentioning it. Um, the, day, the day drama was released is the same day that Black Bear stopped attending school. That night, the Apaches headed south to a hidden valley deep in the mountains where Black Bear grew taller and stronger uh, as, as they spent time there. None can send an arrow with greater accuracy to its goal. Geronimo is concerned his warriors have lost their edge. So while in the mountains, Black Bear hears the thunder of stampeding horses. Mexican soldiers had spooked the Indians' herd. Black Bear joins Geronimo and some 20 warriors on the trail. Two more battles, and we shall be warriors, says Black Bear. And that must conclude chapter um, 7. Yeah. And the one thing I want to reemphasize from that chapter, I think you covered it well, but it's just important, is that the, white, the whites really had no idea about... Uh, Apache culture when they were trying to make, make uh, treaties with them. Even beyond the fact that they would often break the treaties, they didn't appreciate that the Apaches were different tribes with different leaders. And you might have a particularly charismatic leader like Cochise or Geronimo temporarily bringing them all under one authority. But they were different, you know, different sub-tribes amongst the Apaches. I don't know if that's the right term. That would often fight each other. And you could not just make a deal with one chief and assume that every Apache would, would, would uh, know about that deal or honor it. And uh, Burroughs makes it very clear to us, the readers, that this is the case, but he also makes it very clear that the white authorities had no idea of this at all and apparently weren't even trying to learn about Apache culture in order to be able to deal with them more fairly. They were just going in there blind. There, there is an old saying, and, and uh, so I'm quoting direct, Know thy enemy, mm -hmm. and also another old saying is is, is know your business partner mm -hmm. who you're trying to do business with, and either however you however whichever one of those you want to apply to this situation, you're very right. Yeah. There there was no effort or very little effort by the white people to understand who they were dealing with and yeah. what their what their needs were, and there's so much of American Indian culture that we could we could and my ancestors uh, could have learned mm -hmm. that they would asked and been nice and been fair yeah that's very true and it's uh, kind of it's their irony that black bear understands the importance of understanding your enemy uh he doesn't want to want it to make peace he just wants to be able to fight them more effectively but he gets this very important point that the white authorities do not get at all exactly and it's a it's a very good point that he, that he picks up on which mm -hmm. uh, will, will be of his benefit later on in the story mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, Scott, I think you were going to do the middle part of the book, right? Sure, uh, yeah, basically chapters 8 through 14, uh, the middle third. And uh, one thing I've noticed with Burroughs' writing, he does it in this book, he does it in other ones. Uh, Jess, I appreciate the way you, you laid out all the events that are happening coming up to this point. Because uh, a lot of times when I read a ERB book, kind of reminds me of a... a, a long go fishing crew going off like on sea of galilee or whatever the leaf port and and the traverse towards the first places they want to throw out the net so they get ready they leave the uh port area and go on the lake and and uh check the waters and, and set up for for their catch then in the middle of his books uh, burrows will suddenly it's like you throw out the net cast it out pull it in with the catch throw it out pull it in with this catch and uh, it, it's almost like explosion. There's so many things that go on in the middle before they draw it in. They bring in what they've got into their boat, and then the adventure getting back to port with it before everything is resolved. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to approach these chapters more in a general overlook because there's so much going on. There's so many trails going on here um, that I'll get confused. It reminds me of the old... Uh, Johnny Carson skit he used to do for used cars. I think they did on Hee Haw, too. Take uh, Highway 101 to Highway 304 to Highway 410 and <laughs> Highway 5, and pretty soon you see this chalkboard, and they got lines crisscrossing every which way. <laughs> <laughs> so 
uh, picking up where we just talked about, where they're looking at two more battles become warriors. This middle part uh, gears around several main themes. One, for Black Bear, becoming a uh, warrior and, um, and then also uh, becoming a, a war chief. Uh, the other is that uh, Ju is out there um, constantly uh, as a uh, nemesis, as an enemy. The other is his uh, love for Ishkane and how is he going to resolve that and how is he going to find his place in the tribe and what other adventures come in here. Uh, it also establishes a number of adventures with the uh, Mexican or the uh, uh, Spaniards in Mexico. They, they have been in this area of Southwest for more years than the uh, many of the uh, other European or Anglo settlers coming across. They've had a longer history with the Apache and uh, therefore have had treaties, have had broken treaties, and they view uh, the uh, Mexicans as being their first enemy and the uh, uh, what we call the U.S. people, or you know, however they want to refer to them, uh, the white man, being their second enemy because they're a newer tribe, but they see that there are great numbers or newer newer uh, uh, enemy, if you want to call them, newer people they're encountering. But also, some of them are starting to realize there's a huge number of them out there, and they might have a shorter history with them in being victorious than they will with the uh, Mexicans. During the course of this time, uh, there are several escapades, several journeys in which the uh, Apaches and the tribes mix in with the Mexicans, both for a peace or a false peace, if you want to know about it, or to see, um, to kind of be under the radar and uh, hopefully not be attacked or, or be uh, uh, in more war confrontations with them. During this time, Black Bear is able to uh, observe, to see how the uh, ranchers and Mexicans um, run their businesses, uh, take care of their horses, uh, uh, take care of their uh, territories. And there are several battles that go in and out of this time. I'm trying to remember each of these points in my head here <laughs> as it comes up. He does want to uh, marry Ishkane. He uh, uh, does uh, uh, earn the right to be a warrior, but Joe is not uh, in favor of it, and he casts votes against him. Uh, there is a point where there's a great victory, and out of that charisma, if you want to call it, the grassroots uprising, the other people in the area start calling for Black Bear to uh, recognize him as a war chief, that he is above and beyond the normal warrior. Uh, which in time is not going to settle well with Joe either, who wants to also marry Ishkane. Uh, so in their different travels back and forth, Joe is working with the father of Ishkane to set up a way for uh, himself to take her as a bride. Uh, uh, Black Bear has also worked with uh, her father, uh, ends up working with her father to want to take her as a bride. And her father demands uh, 50 horses from him, which which is a uh, <laughs> huge, huge undertaking. Uh, in the course of this, he uh, uh, runs into a confrontation where a uh, woman is being harassed and saves her, uh, whether you want to call it uh, from kidnapping, from uh, rape, or from being murdered uh, by someone who he thinks who... who the one uh, cowboy believes he should actually be her fiance or be married to her. He rescues her from him, and that is the uh, girl Wichita Billings, in, which is set up uh, for more parts in the story involving escapades uh, or, or adventures with uh, cavalry, cavalry officers. Um, her father, uh, later on again, uh, Black Bear will run into her, and when you get later in the book, uh, Tim will also be talking more about her. Mm -hmm. But she is a whole new element of uh, both uh, adventure and action. Uh, now she's a female, so there's a counterpart between Ishkane and her. Uh, and, uh, that black bear feels a, a strange, let me just say, 
an unsettled uh, attraction also to her, but he deems it upon the fact that he believes he's saving a quote-unquote, uh, maybe not quote, but someone he views as an innocent uh, uh, from being murdered or, or savaged by someone else, regardless of whether they're uh, cowboys or they're Mexicans or Apaches. He does take that, if you want to call it, more noble stand that if someone is smaller or more helpless, there is not a reason they should have to be bullied or tortured or have their life put under the thumb of someone who, who just because they've got a gun or have more power. Mm -hmm. uh, that also, when you're talking earlier, Tim, about Tarzan, shows that with the great apes in that social structure, even though you would think of them as being together as a group or family, which defensively in the most part they are, there were still rivalries and, and, and um, bloodthirst or hate within that group, just as we see within the tribes here in the Apaches, like Ja wanting originally to kill Black Bear when he's a baby and having a jealousy or hatred to him uh, uh, throughout this time. I find those very interesting uh, parallels in that way. Mm -hmm. He does end up going down uh, because of that time he had observed. There's one ranch in particular where there are a lot of horses, and he does get down there, and he does manage to get 50 ponies or more horses out from this ranch. Um, also convinces a, a uh, uh, if you want to call it, Mexican militia that there's 50 or more Apaches in the hills taking these horses away, not just he alone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's another, that, it's another great action sequence. It really is. It really is. You know, uh, we've talked about this in other uh, times, too. Burroughs is an incredibly cinematic writer. Mm -hmm. he, he puts so much action, and, and he can take these little detours, just like when you get a scene, a spy movie, you know, takes place in Washington, D.C., and then you go to Moscow and see something happening there, and then in uh, Italy and something happening there, and then back into Washington. And, and the uh, uh, secret agent, or James Bond, or whoever, traveling from city to city, getting involved with these different characters. He does that very well well here. And that's uh, Black Bear encounters these different people, friends and foe throughout. Uh, he does end up losing those horses to uh, 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 U.S. cavalry, uh, which also leads into more encounters between the cavalry and Wichita Billings uh, coming up uh, in that area, and also to Ju wanting to take Ishkane as his wife and leading Ishkane and the rest of the tribe at that time to believe that uh, Black Bear is dead. Uh, to go along with this, I had a couple excerpts. We were talking before about the, the integrity of Burl's writing and how he treated this. I believe he did at one time, I'm going to say the Seventh Gallery, I believe he rode or worked with, in some capacity, the cavalry in the southwest, besides being a cowboy on his brother's ranch when he was younger up in the Idaho area. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah he did. I think he was uh, released early for health reasons, but he did briefly serve in the cavalry. Yeah, and I believe that was in the southwest. Uh, and so I think he's got firsthand information on this here. And I have a couple excerpts from other books I want to read, but what they do is really support his knowledge in the way he wrote to have that touch of authenticity and and to uh, 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 show what he had there. Also to say, if these were history or documentary books, they, with a little extra uh, dramatic narrative, could very well fit into a book like this. Mm -hmm. The first uh, passage I want to read out of is from a book called Black Elk Speaks. And this is similar to uh, what we're talking, did they really have to have a dowry? Well, a, a dowry is not uncommon in, in uh, many societies in the world. You know, whether you're in India or you're, you're in... Uh, well, in, uh, in, in South France Sudan. Or Romania or Russia. <laughs> yeah, in South Sudan, where I've been several times, it costs so many cattle. From, to give, you have to give the father so many cattle in order to be able to marry uh, the girl. Yes, and and so I'm going to read uh, about four paragraphs here out of Black Elk Speaks, which uh, is very is somewhat similar to the uh, Burroughs writing here. And I'm doing this as a comparison, and so people can read 
the book on their own or if they already have her again, but to just uh, uh, set this up as a uh, uh, comparison. Red Deer was another young fellow, and he and High Horse were great comrades, always doing things together. Red Deer saw how High Horse was acting, and he said, Cousin, what is the matter? Are you sick in the belly? You look as though you were going to die. Then High Horse told Red Deer how it was, and said he thought he could not stay alive much longer if he could not marry the girl pretty quick. Red Deer thought a while, and then he said, Cousin, I have a plan. And if you are man enough to do as I tell you, then everything will be all right. She will not run away with you. Her old man will not take four horses, and four horses are all you can get. You must steal her and run away with her. Then after a while, you can come back, and the old man cannot do anything because she will be your woman. Probably she wants you to steal her anyway. So they planned what High Horse had to do, and he said he loved the girl so much that he was man enough to do anything Red Deer or anybody else could think of. So this is what they did. That night, late, they sneaked up to the girl's teepee and waited until it sounded inside as though the old man and the old woman and the girl were sound asleep. Then High Horse crawled under the teepee with a knife. He had to cut the rawhide thongs first, and then Red Deer, who was pulling up the stakes around that side of the teepee, was going to help drag the girl outside and gag her. After that, High Horse could put her across his pony in front of him and hurry out of there and be happy all the rest of his life. Now, they, they picture a similar scenario or thought process going on in, uh, in The War Chief, where uh, he thinks about that other thing about that, where, you know, you could just, uh, or she even, Eshkenay mentioned, we can just run off together, but uh, Black Bear doesn't want to settle for that. He wants to do things what he considers the right way, the social way, the way that he, as a warrior, would have others do for him and he will do to others. I, I, I just, I love that passage because it could so easily have been in that in that mm -hmm. book. Then uh, from this other one, Great Crazy Horse and Chief White Cloud, uh, it's by uh, Ed McGaw, who's also known as Eagle Man. And uh, in here, he, uh, uh, in, in the War Chief, there's a section where he does become a warrior, and then when the people start referring to him as War Chief uh, because of, of his bravery and the power he had in battle, uh, the fact he lived through it and what he did. And here they're talking about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Native American who would be talking to here is talking about. He says, when I came of age to become a full-fledged warrior, my people were beginning to follow Crazy Horse, even though he was yet young. His exploits were such that warriors wanted to be with him. Reputation in the field reaped followers. A rapidly growing reputation like Crazy Horse display, a uh, uh, rapidly growing reputation like Crazy Horse displayed, ignored the regular custom that a leader had to be older. In those times, many an older leader's term was suddenly cut short by a rifle ball or those of later gather Jesus or cartridges. Heavy combat saw many casualties and rank rose swiftly for some. There was a time when all we heard of was Red Cloud and his successful exploits and challenges. I was never selected for his war parties not, and not through avoidance of my own services, but I remained continually at the services of Crazy Horse and I am sure the older chief appreciated my few talents back in those days. In 1868, the chief of the Ogalas had signed the treaty and would fight no more. Chief Spotted Tail by then also gave up the path of war. They said that both men became quite convinced that there were just too many people back east to fight them all. And there were people back there, they said, that liked the Indians, and those were the ones who kept the white man from coming out and killing all of us with his entire enemy after they had quit fighting each other. I, I like that as a support, that uh, is very viable what, what could have happened. There's another part, uh, um, I think is in this middle section, as I'm thinking, maybe is in a part just where you were talking about, but uh, where they're talking about having to get ready for battle. And uh, uh, actually, I think it was in the middle part here that we're discussing. And uh, a black bear puts on the pants, but it shaves him and he doesn't like it. But it's customary for the look for them to have these 
these pants on into battle. He finally drives him nuts and takes him th- and gets rid of him because he doesn't want to wear him on horseback, which reminds me of uh, some scenes where Tarzan no longer wants to be wearing <laughs> the pants or the shirt and takes those off because he can move and breathe. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there's a section here, and this is again from the Crazy Horse Chief Red Cloud book, said, within minutes, a dozen mounted Omaha warriors formed an up formed an opposing battle line and were riding their best horses that had been kept tied up to the teepee at night for this very reason. I could now see from a better position and realize I was not yet a real warrior and wondered if I could ever be. For several tense moments, the battlefield came into military order. Most were bare-chested. There was no time for the Omaha to dress in their fine clothes, but they came forward, for it truly did not matter what they wore. They were completely intent on answering the challenge that are formation pose. And I like this because it shows this young person wondering if he's going to be a warrior. And and they talk about this in, in uh, The War Chief. The young men talking together. It's like I remember when, when I was in the Air Force. Oh, are you going to make sergeant? Or are you going to get deployed to this person or whatever like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, Burrell's authenticity, his integrity in writing this. And at times of change, uh, I'm, I'm not doing a description about political correctness, but from a narrative and dramatic point, he, he, he's bringing very plausible moments into this, both into the thoughts of the characters, into the words, and into the action of the characters. Mm-hmm. And this truly helps move the uh, uh, story along, the parts about the clothes, wearing clothes, having having the horses ready. Here, here they are in their camp in this passage I just wrote. They had kept the horses ready and mounted because they knew there's going to be a moment they needed them. They didn't use them for other chores they had anything else they were going if you want to call it uh almost into a parade formation uh for the battle if you go into american history you see uh, there were times when the british troops considered the american troops as cheating when they're fighting because the british would be uh, uh in their armed and fully dressed in their uniforms and marching across a field where uh, the colonists were taking lessons from the French and American Indian War in which uh, hide behind the trees, be, get behind a rock. Why, why stand up and get shot if you don't need <laughs> to get hurt or killed? You know? mm-hmm. we're, we're at war. The purpose is to stay alive and fight for another day. And and he brings those elements into this book, too. Uh, That's the effectiveness of guerrilla warfare, which the American revolutionaries did use very well against the Brits. And exactly. Then- in guerrilla warfare come up again and again later on after that in warfare. Yeah. yeah, and Geronimo's credited with being one of the best generals in American history because of his skilled use of guerrilla warfare. Exactly. So. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's so much that goes on in the this middle third of the book, seven chapters. I wanted to kind of round it out like that about the plausibility, mm-hmm. about the storylines crossing, which brings us up to when when uh uh, Black Bear comes to the camp and he finds out his people have dispersed again, which was not an uncommon thing for them, uh, a nomadic type thing, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, some of the, um, I believe it might have been the Cherokees, some of the Indians out east actually had originally cabins mm-hmm. <laughs> and farmland that they tilled. Uh, the Plains Indians and in the Teepees and, and the Apaches. Uh, were much more nomadic. The Navajo tended to have their areas in the cliff dwellings or, or in on the uh, uh, close to the desert areas, uh, uh, northern Arizona or, or uh, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, in which they actually created the, the, in the pueblos little cities and villages that they could live in for a long time. So Black Bear comes by, finds the people have dispersed again. And he knows there will be telltale signs on how to follow which parts of the tribe went here or there, and they go on, which I guess would lead up to uh, your part, Tim. Yeah. And, uh, Excuse me, if I may jump in real quick. Mm-hmm. Yes. I just wanted to address a question that Scott had raised. Burroughs did indeed spend some time in Arizona along about 1896 and before, before in 1900. Burroughs was with the Seventh Cavalry there. He enlisted as a as a private, and he was at Fort Grant in Arizona, near Wilcox, Arizona. And in fact, uh, a moment here for a plug and public service announcement: uh, Wilcox, Arizona, the Fort Grant area, is the um, 
where the uh, Dum Dum Gathering from the Burroughs Bibliophiles, and that's what they call their annual meetings, the Dum Dum, uh, for 2019, Wilcox, Arizona, the Fort Grant area, coming up August 1 through 4. Cool. All right, that's cool. Uh, the other thing I want to th say that this highlights about Burroughs' skill as a writer was Burroughs was a great world builder to build something completely original like Mars or Pellucidor. Or, tar or the Tarzan version of Africa. But it's obvious he could also research real history properly and build a story around actual historical events um, that his imagination ran in both directions, and he was a great writer in, in, both, in uh, uh, both of those situations. Yeah, absolutely, and stands alongside when, when we're looking at this as a Western, uh, you know, there's a strong following for Max Brand, Westerns, and Louis L'Amour, who Louis L'Amour also did some historical, more historical novels. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, besides uh, what he's best known for, for Westerns. And I would place The War Chief, and in time we'll probably discuss uh, Apache Devil too. I would place that alongside either either of, of uh, any of the Westerns by either author or author names uh, for being just a... a uh, Rereading it here as we did for this here from from years ago, I was just struck and amazed by. It. I, I I'd stop and I go, "Wow, <laughs> this is really good." <laughs> and 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 I had the same when I read this for this podcast. I actually realized when I was reading it that uh, War Chief was one of the few Burroughs books I had never read before. I had forgotten that I hadn't read it, and uh, uh, I was just knocked dead by how good it was just as a western. Uh, even, you know, even, you know, you know, it's just, I agree. It's right up there with Brand and L'Amour and uh, Luke Short and the other great Western writers. Yeah. That reminds me, we made the point the first time we tried this podcast. This is a, a second try, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we made the point that this, this story was well worth being made into a future a feature movie. Why that never occurred is beyond me. But the material is there as good as any other Western you're going to find. Yeah. He's well, until recent years, a, a movie showing the Apaches as the good guys probably uh, would have been would have been uh, uh, vetoed by movie executives. You're, so, you're, you're correct. In the heyday of the Western back in the '60s, that probably was not a very popular idea. That's yeah, true. but it would make a great a great uh, movie or a great miniseries, would, uh, you know, allowing time for the characters to grow the way they do in the novel. And so. I think it's one of John Ford's last big movies, uh, Cheyenne Autumn, which really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, showed them in a different light like that too, and it, it's well respected now. It was not, if I remember right, a huge giant money maker, but in the last 20, 25 years since movies like Dances with Wolves and stuff come out, I think this would. I'd love to see Netflix or Amazon take this on, make it like a, a, a three-hour miniseries or, or a larger event movie. It mm -hmm. has everything in there. They could combine it with Apache Devil. It would. It would be. Yeah if, done, I, I, yeah, if done well, it would be fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, um, the other thing I want to mention in here is we do meet Wichita Billings. And at this point in the story, you know, uh, um, uh, Black Bear still wants to marry Ishkane, and, and Wichita is just sort of a person in his life. Uh, but it, it kind of reminds me of Tarzan the Untamed, where – Tarzan thinks Jane is dead through most of the uh, uh, most of the um, book, and mm -hmm. there's another woman named Bertha who who enters the story. And originally, before the editors made him change it, Burroughs was planning on killing off uh, Jane, and Bertha was a potential new love interest. Um, so we kind of we kind of see the same thing here that you know Ishkane, as we're going to find out in a moment, is going to die. And he's setting up Wichita as another potential love interest uh, uh, um, for for later on. Uh, so anyway, uh, with chapter 15 through the end of the book, once again, it's very like with the middle part. It's very episodic. It's very difficult to general to to give a general plot summary without going all over the place. And that's not a criticism of the book, as Scott pointed out. It's one of the strengths of the book. You know, uh, Burroughs was excellent at plot, and when he had a lot of plot threads going, he kept track of them and, and allowed us as readers to keep track of them very well. So we never lose track of what's going on, and everything follows a logical s uh, sequence. Um, but as Scott mentioned, uh, Ja 
tells Ishkene that Black Bear is dead, so Ishkene agrees to be, to be Ja's wife. But Ja proves to be a creep as a husband, too, and eventually abandons her when she is injured and dying. And Black Bear finds her uh, as she is dying, and it's just, it's just a wonderfully emotional scene. To quote from the book, quote, once she rallied and looked up at him, my black bear, she whispered, and then hold me close. There was fear in those three words. Never before had black bear, black bear heard a note of fear, fear in the voice of Ishkene. Very gently, the savage warrior pressed, pressed the slender body closer. There was a long sigh, and Ishkene went limp in his embrace. Black bear, war chief among the Bidon Kohi, buried his face in the soft neck, and a single choking sob convulsed his great frame. Um, and it's knowing how stoic he is in all situations up to until then, that just one sob just shows just how broken he was by Ishkene's death. Um, he tracks Ja down, and they finally have it out in a fight to the death, which is another superb action sequence. Uh, Black Bear goes off to Mexico for a while, and there's a really a pretty epic chapter where he becomes kind of a legend, and is uh, a legend down there as he, as he lives a solitary life. And anything that happens that can't be explained or somebody's killed or something's killed, it's blamed on Black Bear whether he's actually responsible or not or tr attributed to him. But time heals all wounds. Eventually, he heads back north to try and find his tribe. Um, he has an encounter with a cavalry officer named Lieutenant King, who we, uh, who we had met earlier. He's a friend of – King is a friend of Wichita. Um, where he shows King mercy in order to, because of his friendship to Wichita. And an important part of King is he is a brave and honorable man. He's shown to be brave and quick thinking in battle. And uh, he appreciates uh, uh, Black Bear's uh, showing mercy to him. He doesn't have the only good Indian is a dead Indian attitude. It once again shows Burroughs' moral balance. Not all white guys are bad guys. Uh, however, however much our culture might be in the wrong in this situation, just like not all Apaches are good, are bad guys are good guys. There's good and evil amongst all men, and there's a king is kind of the, the 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 character amongst the whites that that represents that. He's just he's a pretty cool guy and a likable guy. Um, but the the book comes to an end when Black Bear ends up saving Wichita from some other Apaches uh, because he feels once again that women and children shouldn't be targeted and that they have kind of become friends and he, uh, and he wants to rescue her. He even kills a couple of Apaches from another tribe in order to rescue her. He takes her to Ger see Geronimo. She's terrified at first because Geronimo, from her point of view, is almost a demonic figure. Um, and she gets a little character growth when she realizes that the Apaches are not automatically these horrible demonic killers. Um, they kind of start to fall in love, although the novel ends with them accepting that they're from different cultures and going their different ways. Um, and I, I actually, I, I mentioned I hadn't read War Chief yet. I still have to read Apache Devil, so I'm, assur I'm assuming there's more to their relationship in the sequel. But um, I haven't read it yet myself, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so the novel comes to an end with obvious room for a sequel, which Burroughs soon wrote. And... Uh, I just will end by saying it really is just a superb book, one of Burroughs' top books, and uh, 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 on the top of the list for best westerns ever, too. It's just, uh, just it's vivid, it's exciting, it has great characters, both good and bad, that we can or relate to or whose motivations we can understand. Um, he explains Apache culture to us in ways that we can sympathize with them even when there's aspects to it that he's criticizing, like their tendency to torture or to kill women and children. Um, so, he, uh, so there's that moral balance to the book, too. It really is just a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, those, uh, to those listening to this broadcast, if you haven't read it, to, you need to. If you have read it, go back and read it again and just with a, hopefully a new appreciation. You also, when you mentioned the... Uh, um uh, bat his battle, Black Bear's battle with the Jew, too. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, my mind sprang open. I forgot it happened while I read the book, too. Even though this was written almost 100 years ago, 100 years before the release uh, last year of the movie uh, Black Panther, if anyone uh, who has seen it remembers the scene with the Black Panther fighting his cousin for yeah. the uh, position of chief on the cliff in the water, over the cliff there, uh, boy, you could just about put that uh, swing for swing, fist for fist, 
<laughs> yeah, from uh, from uh, the war chief here when they're fighting all over that cliff too. <laughs> you actually could. Yeah, there's a good parallel there. So, uh, so any any last comments on the book from either of you guys? Well, I would like to certainly offer a plug, another public service announcement for the Edgar Rice Burroughs web comics, mm -hmm. which includes a series devoted to War Chief, uh, written there by Martin Powell. Uh, artist now is Tony Barber. Uh, Nick Polywicko uh, did uh, several of the uh, panels up to episode number 113, but Tony Barber is handling the artwork now. Uh, Martin and the team there is turning out a fine, fine uh, web comic based on the war chief uh, stories mm -hmm. uh, brilliant color action uh, it's, it's, it's a beauty beauty to, to, to look at as are all of these uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs web comics and you'll find out more about them at the Edgar Rice Burroughs Inc website that's edgarriceburrows.com and for the comics you can also add a slash comics or simply go to the home page and make your way over to the comics there you'll find that the Subscription fee is like $22, $23 per year. Uh, it's some of the cheapest entertainment you're going to get, I have yeah. to tell you that. And it's well yeah, worth I it. Two, I think it's 2 bucks a month if you want on a subscription. And, mm -hmm. and I, I can't say enough good things about about the writing of the stories, the adaptations, and the artwork. They're just beautiful. I'm, I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm one of those sitting on the side going, please, please put this out on hard copy print. Mm -hmm. But interesting side note about... Uh, Two months ago, I had a meeting with the local writers group here, and uh, um, we were doing some book reviews and, and uh, uh, judging some local publications. And one of the guys there who's uh, he just had his third book come out came in, and uh, we were having coffee. He said, hey, Scott, I got to let you know. He says, I've been seeing you putting sharing these posts on Facebook. He said, I went out there. He says, I'm going to subscribe to that. Those web comics look great. Yeah, they're all good. I, I, we are stressing War Chief here, but I think I've been particularly enjoying uh, Pellucidor, written by Chuck Dixon, I believe, and yeah. uh, um, which is an original story set in the Pellucidor. And then The Land of Time Forgot, which is adapting those three novels, has been doing superb work as well. And um, but that's that's just two more out of what there's over a dozen of them, right? And they're all good. Yeah. So. And any 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 place that helps showcase and bring out Korak is, 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 gets an extra thumbs up for me because Korak was my tune in when I was a kid in the 60s through Gold Geek Comics. I love the idea of being the son of Tarzan. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so any more, any more comments on War Chief? Yeah. So, read it. Read it. If yes, you read, read it. it. <laughs> yeah, well, oh. I was going to say I, I've enjoyed this. You know, this is the second time we've taped this podcast. We had technical difficulties the first time around and both times have been just an extraordinary experience we had a lot of fun mm -hmm. yes and i was uh, and i appreciate how gracious you guys i meant to mention that at the, on the upside when we started that um this is our second attempt at recording this one and it looks like it's recording fine this time and i appreciated how gracious you guys were about the technical difficulties and losing that first attempt because that was at my end and you guys were just completely supportive and understanding about it and i appreciate that thank you we have no control over a computer problems. Yeah, that's true. Um, wait, so, <laughs> wait till I wait till wait till I make some kind of a goof up of some kind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it was. It'll happen. Uh, so next time we are actually going to be talking about a Tarzan movie, uh, Tarzan in the Valley of Gold, which was from 1965, I believe, with Mike Henry, uh, considered a, one of the better. Tarzan movies, and we'll be also be comparing that to the novelization by Fritz Leiber, um, and so we'll be uh, not dealing directly with one of uh, ERB's novels next time, but talking about uh, one of the movies, which I think is well worthwhile, and this is a movie that should be well remembered because it's just a really good film, uh, and after that, a listener named Casper Richter, if I, ho I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, has been very, has gone on every uh, podcast in the YouTube channel to put in the comment, please do at the Earth's core. And so Casper, we appreciate your interest. We appreciate that you like what we've done. And after we've done Valley of Gold, we will do a podcast on at the Earth's core, which is the first Pellucidor novel and will be fun to talk about because it has dinosaurs in it and dinosaurs make yes. everything better. Um, so and, and oh, it, is, it is a great novel. <laughs> 
so I believe that's it for now. So uh, please visit, uh, on, if you're on Facebook, please look up the Fans of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Jess's uh, 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 Facebook group there. There are a number of excellent Edgar Rice Burroughs Facebooks, but this is the one that has, the, I think, the consistently the best and most intelligent uh, comments and analysis of Edgar Rice Burroughs' work. Um, uh Thank you, Tim, for the compliment. That's for the love of all things, Edgar Rice. For the love of all things, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, That's okay. Yeah, Appreciate and, it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Scott, we're looking forward to Red Canals about uh, the fiction set on, the, uh, on Mars when that comes out. And uh, please remember, I have a blog called Comics Old Time Radio and Other Cool Stuff where you can find links to Amazon.com for my books on there, which you can buy and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. And uh, um, I believe that's it for now. Um, Excuse me, Tim. Uh -huh. I think I think it's important to note that one of your fine books was referenced by another fine book, David Limo, in his Who is Tarzan? That book just came out, like within the last seven days, and he makes reference to one of your books there. Okay, cool. I and mean, I'm looking forward to yeah. I've, I've ordered that book from our local library so that I can state my ego by looking up a reference to me in it. So <laughs> so. So, um, so that's it for now. Uh, so once again, we appreciate uh, you all listening, and uh, we'll be back again with another podcast soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you all.